A hundred days, a million murders. But 18 years on, Rwanda is now a hot new tourist destination. Rwanda is, is really quite well sorted out. On this week's programme, we meet the women rebuilding Rwanda with the help of tourism. We travel to France to try our hand at an extreme medieval sport and... Seeing the full moon in Hong Kong and avoiding the full moon in the Atacama. That's coming up on Insider Guide. Welcome to Fast Track. I'm Fiona Foster. Thank you for joining us. First today, we're heading to Africa and to Rwanda, which is emerging as a fashionable and fast-growing destination. It was the scene 18 years ago of an appalling genocide, which effectively stripped the country of a whole generation of promising young men. That void has been filled by Rwanda's women, who stepped up to the mark to help rebuild their shattered country. Today, more than half the country's MPs are women, as are many of its civil servants, making it a groundbreaker not just in Africa, but in the wider world too. We sent Theopi Skarlatos to Kigali to meet some of the women rebuilding Rwanda. Rwanda, 18 years on from the genocide. Its society is still trying to recover and rebuild. It's come a long way since 1994. Shock, devastation and evil at its worst. In 100 days, as many as a million people were murdered. The stench of death took months to disappear. With many men killed or in exile, the population became 70% women and the job of creating a new Rwanda fell to them. Being a stay-at-home housewife was no longer an option. At the company Gahaya Links, women develop their skills in sewing and weaving and many go on to become entrepreneurs in their own right. The tourism industry is important to them as their products are sold both to visitors and boutique shops across the world. When we came back home from the refugee camp in Uganda, one of the things that we found and experienced was the division between the women of Rwanda. We had two uh, sides, both sides of genocide, women who survived genocide, and then women who have husbands in prison. The, the key achievement I would celebrate really was how seeing the forgiveness within the women weavers. So number one, it repaired their hearts. And then when you look at the side of economic empowerment, these women, especially the widows, they were not looking up to somebody to provide for them. It was using their hands. Many of the women who work at Gahaya were deliberately infected with HIV during the genocide, but there is a sense of equality and unity with everyone working together for a common cause. Gahaya Links has helped more than 4,000 women since it was set up in 2004, and the key has been teaching them new skills and also giving them a better wage than many, helping to empower them in other areas of their lives. How do you think your life's changed since you started working? Now I have a bank account. I didn't know about it before, but now I can pay my wages into my account and I save. And if I have any problems, I can talk to them. And I feel more equal because my husband works too and we work together to look after our household. Not far away in the bustling Muslim quarter of the Nimirambo district, a heavily pregnant Maria May is doing her weekly shop. As well as running the local women's centre, she's one of 500 women working with a local tour company, giving tourists an insight into what life is like for Rwandan women today. She's keen to show she feels equal and excited about the opportunities her baby girl will have. In Rwanda, for women now there are many facilities and there are many chance for the women than before. 
as now the girls can go to school. So I hope to my girl, maybe she can have a place in the parliament or she can be an engineer. She has an opportunity, nothing, they will stop her to do what she wants. Indeed, when Maria May's baby girl is born, she will have many role models to look up to right on her doorstep. A quarter of the country's tour companies are owned by Rwandan women, and more than half of Rwanda's government is female. The predominant role of women has helped the country to address important gender issues. In the election of 2008, that's we came to 56%. And I think it has a very positive impact in our country because uh, it has motivated other women. And again, uh, having a big number of women, really, it has promoted our economic growth of this country. No one doubts that Rwanda's economy has made an impressive recovery. As a tourist destination, it's improving year on year. The number of visitors has almost doubled since 2006. When we started our program um, in 2004, I think in the first year in 2005 we had, we had of the order of 30 or maximum 40 visitors. Um, this year we've got well over um, 120, so it's three or four times larger than it was. Um, and I think we must put a lot of, uh, a lot of, the, a lot of the credit for that growth um, down to the role of women in the society and how actually Rwanda is, is really quite well sorted out. But there is still more to do. There is still severe poverty in Rwanda. The average wage is little more than one dollar a day. Life expectancy is 50, and more than half of women still experience domestic violence. But their strength, it seems, knows no boundaries, and neither does their determination to improve their lives and welcome others into their country with open arms. The OP Skarlatos reporting from Kigali on the important role women are playing in the transformation of Rwanda. And do let us know what you thought of that story. Rwanda, of course, is famous for its gorillas, but would the prospect of meeting some of those inspiring women encourage you further to visit? Drop us a line at our usual address, that's fasttrack at bbc.com. And that's how many of you got in touch following our recent special from Thailand, where we featured, amongst other things, the Tiger Temple at Kanchanaburi. I cannot believe <laughs> I am this close to a tiger, and this tiger is not small. From the outside, this temple looks like a highly efficient money machine. It sets you back $10 to get in, and again to get a photo of you walking with a tiger, or having a tiger in your lap. They do seem incredibly docile now. Well, after that film went out, our inbox immediately started filling up. Many of you were unhappy that we'd featured the tiger temple at all. Ruth Westnidge from Spain was one of them. What on earth is the BBC thinking with this short film? The very last thing that should ever have been produced was a film with a visitor promoting the experience for tourists. Emily from Thailand was equally outraged. I've been to rescue centres in Thailand along with volunteering at them and I know firsthand that Tiger Temple is no sanctuary for rescued animals. It is first and foremost and will always be a tourist trap for the uneducated visitor. While well, Daniel Manning from Bangkok had this to say. I was absolutely disgusted when your show visited the Tiger Temple. The many concerns over how the animals are housed and treated were limited to a single question. Thank you for all your emails on that film. And what we'd like to say in response is that as a travel programme, it's part of our job to feature attractions around the world. And like it or not, the Tiger Temple is a popular attraction in that part of Thailand. Of course, if there's a controversy surrounding an attraction, well, we report on that too. And at several points in the film, Rajan did talk about the allegations surrounding animal cruelty at the temple. And he later went on to put some of those allegations to a spokesman there. What we were trying to do with that film was to encourage potential visitors to ask themselves, is this animal conservation or exploitation? And to maybe do a little more research themselves before deciding whether to buy a ticket or, as we stated in the programme, like many tour groups, to simply stay away.
Now, let's have a look at what else is making news in the world of travel this week. The price of hotel rooms has gone up by nearly two-thirds across the world in the last year. According to a survey by Hotels.com, the cost of a double room rose most sharply in places like Las Vegas, Dubai and Osaka. In Perth, in Australia, travellers can expect to pay 34% more than they did last year. Going to Iceland is expected to become more expensive as the country's government's just announced plans to raise the tax on accommodation, restaurant meals and tourist attractions. The plan is to increase value added tax from 7% to 25.5% from May next year. Tour operators say holidaymakers will be put off by the increase. The potential environmental cost of holding football's World Cup has been spelled out in stark terms by consultants in Brazil. CO2 Zero, which is based in Sao Paulo, reckons around 14 million tonnes of greenhouse gases will be released ahead of and during the tournament in 2014. That's nearly 1% of the country's annual total. Around 600,000 international visitors and 3 million Brazilians are expected to take to the skies during the event. And you might think this building is called Big Ben. Well, it's not. As any self-respecting London tour guide will tell you, Big Ben is the bell. And up until now, the tower it lives in has always simply been called Clock Tower. From this week, though, that's all changed. It's now called the Elizabeth Tower in honour of this year's Diamond Jubilee. Well, stay with us here on Fast Track, because coming up after the break, we head to Hong Kong for the Chinese Mid-Autumn Festival, for fire dragon dancing and lantern displays in this week's Insider Guide. And we go to France to try our hand at water jousting, with some very wet results. Hello, I'm Michelle Yanachan, and this is Fast Track's Insider Guide with my top travel tips from around the world. On September 30th, 
head to Hong Kong for the Chinese Mid-Autumn Festival, which marks both the full moon and harvest time. Hundreds of performers take to the streets around Tai Hang, where there's a fire dragon dance to drum beats every night at 7.30 for the three nights straddling the date. Don't miss the lantern displays at Victoria Park and the opportunity to sample dozens of varieties of mooncakes, from those made with lotus seeds to others made of ice cream. The next few weeks is one of the best times to visit Atosha in Namibia, one of Southern Africa's finest national parks. The rains are yet to arrive and wildlife is gravitating around waterholes. That makes it easier to see the big game as well as hundreds of species of birds. To escape Namibia's high temperatures inland, afterwards head to the Skeleton Coast and look out for the massive breeding colony of Cape fur seals at Cape Cross. In October, bulls come ashore for the rutting season, which can give rise to violent combat scenes. Later in the year is the time to see seal pups born in November and December. Bhutan's three-day Timpu Festival begins September 25th, the country's largest religious event, which commemorates the introduction of Buddhism to the kingdom. Locals dress up in their finest threads, travelling from across the country to the capital. They converge at the Dzongo, or monastery, to watch masked dancers perform traditional stories. Late September, Les Voiles de Saint-Tropez in the south of France is the closing event of the summer season, with hundreds of sailing yachts coming together for a week's racing from October 1st through 5th. Formerly known as La Nulague, the regatta attracts high-performance modern vessels as well as fine traditional yachts to the beautiful bay of Saint-Tropez. The Rolex trophy is awarded to the winner of the classic division over 16 metres. Calling all would-be astronomers. Well, I've just returned from Chile's Atacama Desert, where the region's high altitude and low light pollution offer excellent conditions for both professional researchers and casual stargazers too. Certain observatories here offer guided tours, allowing visitors to look through some of the world's most powerful telescopes. The skies are usually clear at this time of year, just avoid visiting during the full moon. Across the border in Bolivia is the Salar de Uni, the greatest salt pans in the world. During September, flocks of flamingos here are at their most abundant. Towards the end of the year, the rains arrive, turning the pans into a gigantic mirror, a similarly mesmerizing sight. And finally, in Bali, the Ubud Writers and Readers Festival takes place from October 3rd, a celebration of the written and spoken word, whether in books, on screen, in journalism, in lyrics or on stage. Ubud is a centre of art and culture in Indonesia, a delightful town set among rice paddies and steep ravines. During the festival, there'll be book launches, readings and workshops. Thanks for checking in with my Insider Guide this month. Until next time, happy travelling. Thanks, Michelle. We'll see you next time. Now, if you put your travels on hold recently to watch the Olympics, here's something you wouldn't have seen. But maybe the organisers of Rio 2016 should be giving it some thought. Water jousting works along the same principles as medieval horseback jousting, only this time the combatants battle each other from platforms on board barges. It's a sport that's been going for centuries in France, so we sent Fahima Kyle to set in the Languedoc region to see if she's got what it takes to become a water jousting champion. Somehow, I doubt it. In recent years, the picturesque towns of Set and Mez have become popular French holiday destinations. It's their rich history and canals that both define the towns and provide the current that energizes the region. But every summer, for centuries, the main Canal Royal in Set becomes the stage for their traditional sport. 
water jousting. The secret is, is you have no fear. No fear of water, no fear of your opponent, no fear of the land. Inspired by the champions, I head off to neighbouring Mez to meet my jousting trainer. Hey Fabian, how are you? Having lived in France for more than 20 years, Fabian knows everything about jousting. You have to hold on to the, like this, okay? okay? You have blue here, white and then blue again, okay. okay? If your hand goes into this white section when you're jousting, you get a yellow card. If you get three yellow cards, it's a red card and you have to leave. It is a really scary experience, being up there and balancing while looking the opponent in the eye. I might have managed to shake off my opponent into the cold water, but I totally underestimated what it takes to joust. And now the big question to my trainer. Do you think I'm ready? Not for me, not for tomorrow, not for the big competition, but uh, it'd be good to start like everybody else does. And you give us a hand and you yeah. can actually see how the people joust and you can learn the tricks they do. Okay. See you tomorrow. Thank you so much. Okay. I'll see you tomorrow, Bye. yeah? Bye-bye. So the next day, the annual jousting tournament begins. As the tradition requires, we're all now walking down to the port before the tournament starts. In some way, the parade is to show off the modern-day gladiators to the public before the battle. The anticipation is ripe as we all take our positions. And the games commence. The one team in the blue boat, the other in the red. It's one down, but there's five more to go, until the last man standing. And after all the tension and drama, I'm glad I didn't compete. But at least I managed to experience the best of jousting. Fahima Kyle reporting from France. Somehow I don't think we're going to be seeing that sport in the Olympics anytime soon. Talking of which, next week Rajan will be travelling through Brazil. A country aiming to be one of the world's biggest destinations in the next four years. He takes to air, sea and land to find out whether all those new tourists could damage the country's hard-won eco-credentials. In the meantime though, if you can't wait a whole week for your next Fast Track fix, you can find us online at bbc.com forward slash Fast Track and there you'll find links to all our accounts on Facebook, Twitter and Pinterest. Now there's something to keep you happy while your flight's delayed at the airport. Until next time though, from me, Fiona Foster and the rest of the Fast Track team, thank you for watching and goodbye.